Okay, good morning. Thanks, Bill. Um, as Bill mentioned, Andy's not here, so I'm in filling in for Andy on this work, and I'm one of the co-authors along with these, with these other uh, co colleagues, Aaron, Hugh Morrison, Roy Rasmussen, Pat Minnis, and uh, Zayn Wang, and Demo Zhang. And uh, we're going to talk today about this commercial aircraft inadvertent cloud seeding, hole punch in canal clouds. And um, one of the first publications that sort of showed an image of this, and I hope by now everybody's seen one of an image similar to this, um, showed up in a WeatherWise article in uh, 1967 and kind of posed this question of meteorological who done it, um, how do these clouds form, and and what are their what is their cause? And I still think there's some people in the room that may not know, so we're going to talk about this today. And here's a more recent image. This was taken from. Um, an Antarctic observing station, and just prior to this photo, um, a C-130 aircraft uh, took off and went through this cloud. As many of you know, there's only that type of aircraft flying in Antarctica, uh, C-130s as far as I know anyway. Um, so the questions I'm hoping to answer are, uh, what are these hole punch and canal clouds? What causes their persistence and spread? And what are some broader implications? I want to start off by saying these are not contrails. These are not what we're used to seeing in the sky produced by aircraft. It is mostly a response to uh, the vapor and the emissions coming out of an aircraft. Instead, these features uh, occur in supercooled clouds, um, uh, supercooled liquid water clouds with temperatures below about minus 10 and more commonly closer to minus uh, 30 Celsius. But we believe that they're not rem remotely due to anything to do with, uh, with the engine uh, combustion at, at all. And um, some local flavor here with uh, Seattle. We have the uh, studies of 1983 and 84 by Art Ragno and Peter Hobbs that actually recognized this as something that could actually be occurring because they were out there searching in the clouds and sampling the clouds. They were actually uh, cognizant of it back then that they might actually be producing it. So they mention here in, the, in this article about a number of occasions they have observed uh, ground ice particle uh, holes and short streaks of ice crystals in alto cumulus cloud layers, which otherwise consisted of, of liquid drops, and they speculated that these were produced by aircraft. On only one occasion did they actually observe an aircraft, in this case a commercial jet, um, actually pass through the cloud prior to the development of these um, ice trails. And back then they they used this term uh, propeller aircraft and aircraft produced ice particles, but now. Um, I think it's pretty more widely accepted that jets can cause them too, not just propeller aircraft. Um, some more recent studies, though, Woodley um, here, they actually purposely went out there trying to create these, these, uh, these types of holes and clouds and, and streaks and clouds, and they took these nine different aircraft, a King Air that was mostly used for the, the sampling behind these other aircraft, which are listed here, Piper Aztec, a Cessna 421, two uh, T-28s, an Aero Commander, a Piper Navajo, um, a Beach Turbo Baron, and um, another King Air. So they basically flew the, uh, the Cloud Physics King Air behind these other aircraft and wanted to see which ones might be responsible for producing these ice crystals. And um, they found out that the King Air itself was actually quite um, efficient at making these APIPs. Um, however, there were a couple there listed at the end, the Cessna, the Piper Navajo, and the, and the Beach Turbo Baron that did not produce um, uh, ice crystals behind them. Um, and they also concluded in these studies that homogeneous nucleation was the probable cause of the, of the ice um, in adiabatic cooled regions where the air is expanding around the uh, rotating propeller tips. And then some modeling sort of helps confirm that, that uh, Gearins did here with the aerodynamic modeling over aircraft wings, and on the top panel is what happens when you have a fast-flying aircraft like, a, like an Airbus 340 um, flying at either Mach, 7, Mach 0.7 or Mach 0.8, and it's capable of producing about a 10 Celsius temperature drop just over the wings. This is not anything to do with, um, with the, well, this is not a propeller aircraft, it's a jet. Um, it, that temperature drop can be up to 10, about 10 Celsius at typical jet altitudes of uh, of 350 millibars up there. Um, however, a much slower flying aircraft like a, like a C-130 can only produce about a two, two Celsius temperature drop over its wings. So um, they, most people believe that the C-130 is doing it by the, by the propeller blades, not by the wing 
of the aircraft. It's not enough cooling potential just over the wing. Uh, here's a pretty spectacular example of uh, just how wide, how you should be able to see these easily if you just pay attention to some satellite images and maybe go outside and look for it. In fact, Andy took a picture of one uh, just about three weeks ago in the Denver area. Uh, he looked up and saw a whole, a whole cloud. But here's a spectacular example from um, June, uh, January of, I think, 2007. And um, each one of those uh, long canal shapes or holes, um, Andy and others have traced back to an aircraft that penetrated this cloud. And this cloud, um, I'm going to show in the next talk, is at about minus 30 Celsius. And it's completely composed of liquid water. And then the aircraft fly through it and create the ice and then leave these holes. So they. They tracked these holes just by sequences of GOES images and started making estimates of their motion or their growth over time. Now, the aircraft is obviously much smaller than the footprint of a, of a satellite pixel, um, so it does take some time to develop in the first place, but then it does expand from there. And so they did track as many as 90 holes in those images, and they uh, went back and correlated it to um, uh, air traffic control data and found out that they pretty much think they've nailed down about half of those 90 holes as to which actual particular aircraft caused it and found that they were um, jets of many different types. There were some military jets in there too, but as well there were some large commercial passenger jets um, and a few propeller aircraft, but at the altitude of that cloud there just aren't that many propeller aircraft flying up that high. On the left panel here you can see um, What's plotted is the growth of the whole of the tracked feature on the satellite image with time, and so they generally have a trend of increasing size for about an hour before they start to uh, to shrink back down. A few of them didn't have that, but almost all of them do. Uh, the very large ones are really the the canals, not the more uh, circular cloud holes. And another example of seeing this in some weather data, this is actually a very old image from 1992. Um, I think Roy was involved at this time in the WISP field projects. Where is Roy? Um, oh, he went to another talk. <laughs> um, he was involved in the WISP uh, projects, Winter Icing and Storms Project, and it's believed that these are actually aircraft tracks um, from the Stapleton runways at Denver. So an aircraft would have taken off and, and made this hook turn after taking off to the north and this is the ice trail um, coming out of the cloud and making snow that's reaching the ground. And so this is actually reflectivity here. And you can see some of these echoes reaching um, 25 and higher dBZ. And if you look um, here, you can actually find what we think are actually four distinct uh, trails of aircraft. This is an older one, and the wind's blowing uh, generally lately west to east. So this was just one of these from perhaps 10 minutes earlier. There's another one here. that probably took off more in a, in a northerly, northerly direction, and then a plane probably took off in a uh, left-turning pattern, and then this is the trail of, a, of, a, of another one of the aircraft that took off from Stapleton. So um, basically Andy, Andy thought, well, how often might this occur? Because might it be actually influencing any other weather data? And so he took a look at um, uh, the, the CloudSat data, and started picking out pixels at these, at these airports, Heathrow, Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt uh, Charles de Gaulle, SeaTac, O'Hare, Yellowknife, and Bird in, in, in Antarctic, and just basically took a, a footprint of pixels around these airports and said, how frequently do they have uh, clouds with this temperature range on the top panel of between minus 10 and minus 20, which is certainly going to be um, a pretty good indicator of when it's a liquid cloud there as opposed to an ice cloud and found that at places like Yellowknife, it actually is pretty pretty common occurrence. So this is like almost, a, in a sense, a probability of how good you could actually um, go out there and see this cloud and turn it into ice and make these, make these um, whole clouds visible. And on the bottom panel, it's how often it's less than minus 20, and still liquid water, by the way. And um, so that might be an easier, easier uh, um, chance of creating these ice clouds because um, you don't have to cool it much further down to uh, minus 40 to initiate some ice. So, I mean, it's not a common occurrence, and maybe it's not um, uh, too frequently that uh, you can go and do this, but, and, and it's going to be made much more visible when these things are very shallow, as the uh, satellite picture shows, but it's, it's possible. And 
Um, it also makes for some interesting theories about how that affects the um, uh, uh, actual planned weather modification programs because as you're flying your aircraft, whether you're releasing seeding material or not, you can actually theoretically be causing uh, ice crystals to form and not even know it. So it's a very convoluted little problem there. So in summary, um, I think it shows that both propeller and jet aircraft are possible to produce these ice, ice particles as they pass through these uh, supercooled liquid clouds, whether it's by the propeller tips or the wings that does the um, it, it cools the air sufficiently to do this. Um, these are certainly not contrails, and um, for propeller aircraft, it seems to occur um, at the warmer temperatures, uh, probably mostly because propeller aircraft just don't fly at the coldest uh, temperatures that uh, these jets fly at. Uh, I mentioned that for vertically thin clouds, it can lead to these, um, uh, uh, you can see them a lot better if, if it's a deeper cloud system. You just aren't going to see them that, that often. Uh, in the next talk, I'm going to um, show that wharf model simulations are actually capable of reproducing this phenomenon pretty well, so I'll save that bullet for later. And around major airports in mid-latitudes, um, hole-punch clouds and inadvertent seeding might be possible about 5% of the time, but more for propeller aircraft than jet aircraft um, because of the temperatures for that production um, by the two different mechanisms. And that's all I have. Thank you. <coughs> Questions or comments? <coughs> Since uh, aircraft spend most of their time at surge levels, do you have a feeling for what this has to do uh, with surge clouds? Well, I, I wouldn't expect any, any real uh, change to cirrus clouds since they're mostly ice particles. This is really a phenomenon that occurs because the liquid, they're almost entirely liquid water. In fact, <coughs> I would claim they must be liquid water um, for like the case that I showed the satellite image for. They're, it's, a liquid, it's, it's the fact that liquid is freezing into ice particles is creating this. And cirrus clouds already being composed of ice. They don't need any new ice to do that. Right, but that 10 degree temperature drop could still do something to the microphone. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. It might be adi adding additional ice into the system, sure. And certainly I can see where an ice cloud aloft, a cirrus cloud aloft, could seed into a lower deck. Certainly that would be a possibility, too. Has anybody looked on the wingtip vortices as being a source of that? Because they're pretty sure the pressure drops on the wingtip vortices are greater than that of the floor of the wing. Yeah, we tend to agree. I don't. I don't know of anybody that's doing that, but right. well, might be a little isolated. Wasn't also that the calculation that was shown? It was for the wing tip. I don't actually know that answer. That for the wing in the aerodynamic so modeling. I think it's for the wing tip. Was it? Okay. Tip, tip. Yeah. yeah. I have a dumb question. Um, how do the holes grow? Is it turbulent mixing or? I'll, I hope to answer that in the next talk. <laughs> it has been demonstrated uh, by uh, experiments with Kinger that uh, uh, the, the, the propeller uh, produces uh, uh, ice crystals uh, if it has three blades, but not if it has uh, four blades by uh, homogeneous freezing, homogeneous uh, glaciation. That is a paper by Woody et al. some ten years ago. Right. Any other questions or comments?